you want to learn about psychological growth without sorting through the jargon, you're in the right place. This is the Relational Psych Podcast. I'm your host, licensed therapist Tyson Connor. On this show, we learn about the processes and theories behind personal growth and experience a little bit of it ourselves. This is season two, where we'll focus on the practice of relational psychotherapy and explore concepts and theories that consider psychology from a relational lens. And please keep in mind that this podcast does not constitute therapeutic advice, but we might help you find some. And today, my guest on the podcast is Peter Jabin. Peter is a pastoral psychotherapist and spiritual director in private practice in the East Lake neighborhood of Seattle. He received his MDiv from University of Chicago in 1993 with postgraduate work at the Center for Religion and Psychotherapy of Chicago. Peter is a diaconal minister in the Pacific Northwest Conference of the United Methodist Church. He has trained in the facilitation of grief rituals with Francis Weller, Therese Chavez, Lawrence Cole, and others. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. And today we will begin discussing the question, because I don't know if answering is within the scope of the time we have. <laughs> okay. Why is grief important and crucial to the project of being human and the task of living in a time of cataclysm specifically? I like the question. So <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> it's guess. a big one. Yes, it is. So, Peter, maybe... Before we dive into the first question, which I think should be, what is grief? Do you want to explain a little bit about how how this came to be an area of interest for you? Uh, good question. Yeah, I didn't actually pause to think about that. Um, Sorry, starting before off with coming. No, that's all right. Um, how did I get into this? Uh, started with... Um, a book study, a friend dragged me to a book study uh, at Shambhala Center uh, down in Madison Park on a Peter Levine book, A Year to Live. Mm. Um, met the uh, facilitator there, um, and she got connected with Francis Weller, who I'll talk about in this conversation quite a bit. He's become a teacher of mine. Um, she attended a grief ritual that he facilitated and talked me into uh, joining her for one that was 2017. I went to my first grief ritual down in uh, just outside of Portland. Uh, it was an amazing experience and I've just, I just lit up uh, in this work and attended more rituals, ended up attending a training, um, now into facilitating the work. And, um, you know, ultimately, it was actually the last uh, grief ritual that I facilitated. It kind of came to me that um, I, grew, I showed up in the world with a broken heart, mm. and I have spent most of my life trying to fix that. Mm. And it has, right, this work has been about realizing, oh, no, that is, like, that's part of the gift that I bring to the world. And what I need is community that can not only welcome and tolerate that, but welcome, mm. uh, that, that value, celebrate yeah. the broken heart that I bring to the world. Because, uh, right, if you're paying attention these days to the world... It's, it's a very reasonable response to be brokenhearted. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Sure. So what do we mean by grief? Uh, what do we mean by grief? And uh, if I can, I'd, I'd start answering that uh, in the realm of poetry with some poetry. Uh, this is a, a brief excerpt from a poem by a guy named Steve Garnas Holmes. Uh, and he says, grief is a wild animal that moves into your house. It will never be tamed. You will learn to live with it, its moods and hungers, its sudden movements. You learn to regard it with tenderness. You never learn its language. But sometimes, for the sake of the animal, you go out on the back stoop, overcome with love, and sit beside it and howl. And, and I start with poetry because uh, right, grief is really, it's not 
uh, a cognitive. It's not an analytical thing. It is not something that we grab hold of and process and get done with. And right, mm -hmm. the myth of closure is a myth. We never finish with our grief. It is something that we encounter in the same place that we encounter poetry, mm. dreams, uh, myth, right? It is in a, a deep, um, deep time place that is deep within our genes. Mm. And it's a territory that we enter into uh, and give ourselves to. It's a, sometimes talk about it as a technology that mm. is deep within us. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the technology through which we metabolize our losses and are returned to life, mm -hmm. right? And we don't control it, mm -hmm. right? So this image of it being a beast that moves into our house, that takes us over, and we can learn to live mm -hmm. with it and its rhythms and its movements. Mm -hmm. um, so it is beyond language. It is before language, um, that's a first thing that I would say about it. Um, I imagine that many of our listeners will be familiar with the sort of, what is it, the like stages of death kind of like? Yeah, Kubler-Ross's categories. Five stages of grief. Right, right. which I, I think what you're suggesting kind of stands in contrast to, at the very least, the pop culture version yes. of that, um, where that the sort of pop culture understanding of these five stages, what is it, denial, anger, bargaining, so on and so forth. Yes, anger, denial, bargaining, and, and acceptance. Right. There's another one in there. Yeah. Um, there's despair. There's um, <laughs> there's kind of a an implied process with like an evolutionary kind of process to it where you do this stage and then you do this stage and then you do this stage and then you're done. And, and then, then you've you're accepted it. Yes. And what you're suggesting is that grief is actually not that containable. Um, I My grad school was a seminary as well, and so I was required to take these theology classes. And one of the theology te professors would say that at a certain point, all good theology becomes poetry. Yes, um, and, yes. And that came to mind as you were reading the poem. Just like this yeah. is getting at a level of like human experience that trying to contain it in these kind of rigid clinical cognitive categories ends up failing. And the thing that does a better job is something that's um, something that's a little bit broader, a little bit more associative, a little bit more symbolic, a little bit less rigid. Um, and also that kind of steps out of time a little bit kind of feels like that's part of, part of what you're getting at. Yes. Does that all land or? Uh, it does. And I think like, I think Kubler-Ross, uh, like I've not really read her deeply. Sure. Uh, I, th I think she was, it's a very important contribution for a culture that does not want to talk about mortality or death or grief. Yeah. Very important to open it up. I don't think she intended how, it, how her work is usually appropriated in terms of one, two, three, four, five, and then I'm finished. Right. Um, that's kind of what we do with it because we are uncomfortable with mm. this idea that um, uh, I think it's John O'Donohue says we are initiated into loss at some point in our lives, some, some earlier, some later, but we are initiated into the experience of loss and grief, and then we have a forever developing relationship with that, mm. right? This is, this is, you know, actually the oldest uh, artifacts, cultural artifacts for humanity have to do with funereal rites, mm. right? Mm. So you can say that, that grief is actually like one of the earliest cultural expressions that we have mm. and could even argue that like everything that has followed from that, all art, all inquiry is about uh, dealing with mm -hmm. right the realities of loss and grief. It is a fundamental reality in our life. And uh, yes, it is, um, right, we apprehend it at levels before beneath language, right? It's yeah. why poetry gets to it. Uh, in the grief rituals, it's why we sing a lot, we dance, there's drumming, there's mm -hmm. movement, because it takes us back in our genetic memory to 
to an earlier time. It, the sense that I'm getting is that this this conceptualization of grief sort of doesn't allow it to be something that can just be talked about and felt through in a sort of contained um, sort of objective way. It's something that is a full body thing and needs the full body to be involved. Yes, it is definitely an embodied experience, fully embodied experience. Yeah. It's something that rises up through us, mm -hmm. right? It was definitely an experience in the ritual of feeling it rise mm -hmm. up and find expression often quite surprising, mm -hmm. right? When it, <laughs> when it does find expression, how it comes out might be uh, not at all what I anticipated, what yeah. somebody anticipates. Yeah. And it's very different than talking about the loss, which is also important. Like I'm not sure. dismissing yeah. that. It's important to talk about the loss and process it in an analytical way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only a piece of it. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about these, these five gates of grief. Because okay. uh, listener, having accepted that the thing we're going to talk about is inherently not a thing that you can talk about enough, <laughs> yes. we'll also accept that frameworks are helpful in yes. orienting ourselves, yes. even as they are limited. Yes. So you've read a particular framework of grief. Yes. And this is not my framework. This is actually from Francis Weller, okay. uh, The Five Gates of Grief. This is in his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, which is a wonderful read. Highly recommend it. He is a Jungian. Check the show notes. Okay. <laughs> He's a Jungian uh, therapist who's got just a very, and, and a ritualist, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's got a very lyrical way of writing, and he he came up with this, which is used quite widely in the grief ritual community. And again, he, he talks about the five gates of grief. A gate is a portal; it is an entry point. So, mm -hmm. so these are five entry points to the territory of grief, to the land, the healing, the healing territory of grief. The first, the first gate is everything that we love, we will lose. So this mm. is what we usually think about when we think about grief. This yeah. is um, loss of a parent, loss of a spouse, loss of a beloved animal, can be loss of a job, a place, mm. a home, a, a dream. Um, it can be illness, right? But this is the kind of thing that we usually think about, very personal yeah. losses to us. Um, and w we grieve because we love these things, right? So mm -hmm. at the first gate, this is kind of the, the first lesson about grief is that grief and love are not, right? That they're the same thing. Grief right. grief is a different face of love. We, we don't grieve what we don't love. Right. That's, that's that line that um, people made fun of in WandaVision, but because it was trying to say this and it was trying to say it in a, like a superhero comic book show where an and a living android said to the most powerful magician in the world <laughs> what's what is grief but love persevering yes and like yeah people made fun of it at the time and people got angry on the internet about it but like it sounds like what i'm hearing you say is that's that's that yeah that's the first step of into grief that most of us take yes is our love continues after we have lost yes. someone or something and that is necessarily also an experience of pain. Yeah. And or anger, rage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be a lot of right. effectively, it could be look a lot of different ways. But um, yes, it is uh, losing what we love. Mm -hmm. And it is it is usually where we start in our journey with grief. It's where the world finally gets to us and breaks our heart open. Mm. Mm -hmm. right? And having an open heart, uh, having it broken open, right? We usually think of a broken heart as a bad thing, but it breaks us open to actually be present mm. to the world. So that's the first gate of grief, what we're most familiar with. They get more interesting from there. The second gate of grief that Francis talks about is the places in us that have not known love. So these are parts of ourselves that have not been welcomed, that have been banished and outcast, places of us wrapped in shame. Mm. Uh, and we come to treat these parts of ourselves as they were treated with contempt. Uh, I, I feel like this this gate, the uh, the grieving the places that we have not known love, that, that feels to me like a really common topic for 
psychotherapy yes or to come up in therapy like i feel like a lot of times when i'm talking about people's griefs this is a a kind of complicated level that i get to with people where it Mm -hmm. feels like yeah we're talking about grief that your your um your inquisitive curiosity as a child was treated as an affront to your parents' authority. And so you learn to never ask a question, but Oh God, your, your curiosity is such a delightful, lovable part of yourself that never received love and now receives so much cruelty within yourself. That's for example, um, that feels like the sort of thing that comes up a lot in psychotherapy Mm -hmm. as people are doing a lot of like self work and identity work. Yeah, I think it, it's the result of doing a lot of the therapeutic work to discover these places mm-hmm. that we have come to treat as they were treated. We just jumped on board with right. that. As, as a gay man, like I, I relate to this uh, in terms of that like, very early erotic self like, mm. uh, that that I learned. And nobody, like I didn't get a lot of direct, uh, like nobody was telling me gay was bad sure. in my household, but it's in, it was in the atmosphere. Like I heard... I absorbed it and mm-hmm. I learned this is not, this part of me is not okay. So hide it, push it down, never speak this, never show this, right? And that becomes uh, a really outcast part of myself. And in, in IFS language, becomes an exiled yeah. part of myself. And these parts don't just languish mm-hmm. in the corner, they show up as addiction as self-loathing, as depression, Mm -hmm. as violence, as like that's how these get lived out. So they're very important to attend, to open to this gate. Yeah. And for the listener, IFS is internal family systems, which is a particular modality of psychotherapy, um, way of thinking about people that's very interested in different parts of a person. And that that's a kind of modality that's come up on the show before, but I didn't, I didn't want someone to be like, wait, what's that? That sounds interesting and not have the citation. So (laughs) thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a bit about the second gate. Uh, the third gate that Francis talks about is the sorrows of the world. And this is enormous these days. Like this, (laughs) this is coming into focus in a way, I think, uh, Wild Edge, I think, was published in, I think, 2015. And like how this gate has changed since Mm. Francis published. Um, This is about acknowledging the losses of the world around us. Like even if we try to shut it out, the loss is in the air we breathe with the wildfires. Literally, yeah, it's in the air that we breathe. The earth is scarred. We species are going extinct on a daily basis. Yeah. We are surrounded by rampant consumerism, unrestrained capitalism, a civil society that is fraying, uh, right? It, it's, people are talking about it more and more these days as earth grief, yeah. as extinction anxiety, mm. right? This is all about the third gate, the sorrows of the world. Yeah. Uh, this, this gate is making me think of the Ingmar Bergman movie. A couple of them, actually. No. Ingmar Bergman liked this category, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, both Persona and Winter's Light feel like they're kind of about this on some level. The idea of like, yes, I am fine. Maybe the characters in those films are fine enough. But the world is so full of suffering. Yes. Um, and that this is this is something that I would think of as like an existential kind of kind of thing. All of these kind of fall under that category. Mm-hmm. But when people talk about an existential angst, this this is the kind of thing that comes to my mind. Uh, yes, existential and um, right. I think existentialism maybe used to be um, voluntary or, or optional. Right. Uh, right. It's becoming a <laughs> required reading. Right. For all of us. Right. right, what we are facing, the like I think we are living in a time of cataclysm, and what we do at this gate, yeah, is crucial. Um, I, I do like to think of well, Francis actually suggests this that, um, right, our grief at this gate is actually and literally the soul of the world, the anima mundi weeping through us, like hmm. we are of the earth. Our tears at this gate really literally is the weeping of the earth. Hmm. I've, 
I've heard people talk about how like human consciousness can be thought of as like the universe understanding itself. Yes. And what I'm hearing you say is human grieving can be the universe grieving for itself. Yes. Or at least the planet grieving the planet, for itself. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I'm gonna need to sit with that one for another couple decades, I think. Uh yeah, I think that's what we're I think that's what we're up against and invited yeah. into. Um couple of these gates francis uh references paul shepherd who i have to read yeah um, yeah um a sociologist anthropological sociologist i believe um he reflects on some of these gates like like the the loss that we feel of a sacramental world at the third gate we interpret as our own personal failing we take it on mm. and we're encouraged to do this by our culture to not recognize there is something terribly amiss in our world as we're living collectively. Yeah. We're kind of encouraged to be like, what's wrong with me? Everybody else seems to be okay. Why am I feeling this way? There must be something wrong with me when there's something amiss in the world right? and the way we're living. Yeah. And just to plant the seed for something that will come up later in the conversation, I feel like I see that a lot in conversations around the function of psychotherapy in society, where I see many people saying, like, people tell me to go to therapy, but the problem isn't me. The problem is the, the world. Yeah. And w we'll get to that. And, and listener, I'm also going to put a plug. I don't know where it'll go in this season, but a lot of what we're talking about in this category very much relates to a conversation that we had on this podcast, which you haven't heard yet because I didn't come out yet, <laughs> uh, with Karen Weisbart around the social okay. unconscious and that way that as a, a Western society tends to reject the, the social reality and personalize it, individualize it. Um, so yes. that's just a link. I don't know what to make of it. but Yeah, and I think of, uh, who is it? Um, Krishnamurti, it is no sign of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think there's a shift happening here. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. My, my task with my clients is not to have them function better in society. Right. But to be able to step more fully into a critical relationship to it. Mm. So um, just to hit the last two gates yeah. and, and move on to, um, to other things. Um, Fourth gate that Francis talks about what we expected and do not receive. Uh, uh, there's um, a reference, I don't know who it is, who says we are, uh, another sociologist who says we are born Stone Age children. We come into the mm. world expecting to be received by a village of 40 sets of hands and 40 sets of eyes, not the maybe two, if we're lucky, right. that we get these days that genetically we still come into the world expecting to be received by the, by the village mm. uh, and to be initiated into what Francis calls the primary satisfactions of the world, which is for us companionship and shared meals and mm. an attentive group of elders and communal rituals, like these things that provide connection and fulfillment to human beings. And most of us don't have access right. to these things anymore. Yeah, We live in such isolated, fragmented places um, with such a dearth of resource. Yeah, and that conversation makes me think of another episode we recorded on suicide. And uh, the person we interviewed there, Dr. Tyson Bailey, his diagnosis for society was that most suicide is caused by isolation, um, which feels very much like missing what was expected. Yes. And I'm also, I'm also thinking about this feeling that many people have at some point in their lives that like the world is a little wrong mm -hmm. that go was very brilliantly represented in the matrix movies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think, um, you know, and then there's also layers of queerness and things to be considered in that film. But this, this sense of like, we're meant to be together, but we're not. And there's some, there, I, there's, there's some, some other, some community, some group that I'm, that I don't have or yes. that many of us don't have. Yeah. That feels like a pretty common experience yeah this this gate is about our longing to belong mm. which is at the very core of like we show up with this longing to belong and we have been better there are cultures that are still better than our dominant culture and yeah in in deep time we were better at facilitating that belonging yeah with each other yeah we've really forgotten how to do that and we replace it with substances and 
things and consumption and yeah. distraction and or technology. Like there's all kinds of ways to distract right. from it, but it leaves us feeling lost and desperate. Right. Um, even yes, even suicidal. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. And the last uh, ancestral grief, which was mm. uh, you know kind of I think. This has also changed a lot recently. Just right, really, we can think about this as intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Right? This is what we receive from a history of racism and colonialism and genocide, which the emerging field of epigenetics suggests we actually inherit this genetically, yeah. physically, right? in some way. This trauma is passed down to us. It registers in our bodies. We are carrying it. Yeah. And we can work with it, mm -hmm. right? We can heal even grief that is inherited and not necessarily ours specifically. Yeah. Uh, which is profound healing work mm -hmm. to be engaged in. Um, yeah, much more to say there. But... Yeah. Uh, right, those are the five gates that Francis presents uh, in in the book, and uh, you know he leaves it open. There's more than this, and I hear people talking these days about additional gates of regret, mm. um, the life that I did not live. That I, looking back, I see choices I did not mm -hmm. take, and what did not happen that could have happened. That 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 is a gate of grief. Yeah, um, the harms that I have perpetrated yeah right and again with climate crisis like this is so sharp these days my mm -hmm. daily complicity in what's happening yeah is very painful to hold that is a gate yeah to grief again and it's all of those are about entering the territory and part of what i'm hearing in these is you know that i was i was in sort of like an online support community for people who had left high control religious groups mm -hmm. and it was really common for people to show up in this online space and say like i feel angry or i kind of miss my church and to essentially be posting like is this okay and uh, everyone would jump on and be very supportive and every now and then there'd be someone saying like you're an adult why are you asking other people for permission to feel this way and somebody or other would respond to that person <laughs> and say some variation of uh, people aren't asking permission. People are looking for confirmation that what they're feeling is what it feels like they're feeling. And it sounds like these gates of like ways of entering into grief are, are sort of serving as that saying like, these are not like exhaustive categories. These aren't like the five different versions of grief and every grief falls into one of these. These are outlines of, of ways of grieving, ways of entering grief so that if you listener are hearing this and there's one of these that's striking you or that feels close to something that you've felt that something in you feels a need for some kind of help with or some kind of addressing or some kind of speaking or being something that's already in you these are some some ways that folks have identified this might be a kind of grief you might be having yes. so take this not as permission to fit a category but as potential invitation to begin exploring yeah I, I would say if, if if a listener is feeling resonance with any of any of these perhaps that is something calling mm. to you mm -hmm. saying attend to me right pay attention here there is something right there is a loss that maybe you are carrying that you've not really attended to yeah yet and take it seriously it's important it matters yeah it's valid yeah yeah so let's let's talk about what is and isn't grief first. Yeah, what what it is important to talk about what grief is not, and it, at the rituals we we do. Yeah, because um, uh, there's misconceptions that uh, grief is not resentment, mm -hmm. right? Anger is absolutely an expression of grief. Grief is not just tears and wailing and falling on the ground. Uh, that uh, protest is a mm. form of grief. Yeah. Right? So anger. Yeah. Even rage at times is a form of grief. Resentment is not. Resentment, right? I think of resentment that has been anger that has been held and stuffed and becomes toxic and fetid. Mm. And that needs, uh, right, in the old medieval, right, that needs a bloodletting <laughs> 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 to flow again. 
Right. Um, grief is not self pity. Mm -hmm. That's an easy one to fall into. Absolutely, this is a, I think the primary confusion. Grief and depression are not the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Martine Prechtel, who is also um, just a great speaker, mostly I, his his writing can be hard to follow. Uh, listening to him, he's got some uh, talks on YouTube. If you go to uh, YouTube and look for Martine Prechtel. Uh, grief and Praise. He's wonderful to listen to. Linked in the show notes, listener. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he talks about grief is not sadness. It's not depression. Depression is a lack of grief. It's rage that has no home. It is the homeless beast of sorrow. Mm. Uh, right? So it is not the same as depression. And it is not despair or collapse. Right. Yes. Yes. That feels important. I... Part of, part of the reason I was interested in, in talking to you about this is because at one period of my life, I was going through a process of kind of cyclical, uh, prolonged grief. Um, I was actually in that place when we first met in a little uh, mentoring group that was yes. put on by the Alliance. Um, and my experience of that time was like, I could only make sense of my grief by not collapsing. Like when I collapsed, I didn't, I didn't do any grieving. When I was in despair, I was not... There was not movement. Right. There was le there was death. There was right. non movement. Yes. So that that feels like a really important distinction, and sometimes despair is a place that we go to on our way to get into grief. I yes. think. Um, and then I, I also wanted to on the depression point. Do you, as, as a psychotherapist, I often feel like people come to me with their depression diagnosis mm -hmm. and my experience of sitting with them is like, I, th I think you're grieving dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, this, like, like depression is maybe a label that gets slapped on folks who don't have a category for their grief. Maybe they're experiencing grief from one of these other gates perhaps, or another gate would be a more appropriate way in right. than just loss of a loved one, which is kind of like the category that most people will accept. Um, and so their experience yeah. gets labeled depression. Do you see that often? Uh, yes. And I think, I think it's very common, like with the third gate, like uh, encountering mm. the world these days. And I feel overwhelmed and horrible and like I want to weep and therefore I'm depressed. Well, no, maybe you're actually awake right. and, and responding. Yeah. Uh, in general, yes, I, I find depression any time a client comes and tells me they're depressed like okay that's too easy what does that mean <laughs> what meaning? yeah 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 no yeah no absolutely it's such a absolutely. such a write-off um so that that's some of what's what grief is not what gets in the way of grief uh right is one thing is the myth of private pain and mm -hmm. grief has gotten privatized now you get three days of bereavement leave go go home and feel bad for three days about this major loss that you've had, and then, and then come back, and we're going to get on with it. Like mm -hmm. this privatization of, of pain, and it's why I think therapy is not enough. It is an important point. Right? I, I'm a therapist. I, I sure. value the work, and Absolutely. I think it, it matters. And uh, when it comes to grief, I think therapy is not enough. I think getting into the communal experience of grief is essential. Yeah. It's crucially important and hard to find mm -hmm. in our culture. Um, but the, the myth of private pain is one thing that gets in the way. Fear of getting lost. Uh, people are afraid of grief. If I start, if I, if I step into this, I will never come back. If I had a dime for every time I heard that from somebody, oh man, I'd have my student loans paid off. <laughs> <laughs> That's... I hear that so often. People's fear of getting into... Usually grief. Yeah, what, is, what is that? I mean, I, so one of the things that I've thought about, you know, somebody, one of my professors in grad school s said the fear of grief is that it will never end, which is what you're speaking to here. Mm -hmm. And as the poem stated at the start, the reality is that it doesn't. It never will. The, the f I think part of the fear is that they know, like, if I acknowledge that this thing is with me, then I have to deal with it being with me. And our fear is that we can't handle it. I yes. think, I think. Yeah, it comes to mind something that a, one of my former therapists said to me all the time, what we fear will happen already has. Right, yeah, yeah. 
Was that is that Winnicott? Is I think it? that's Winnicott. Is it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> We're pr- trying to protect ourselves against what is already true, mm-hmm. that grief will never end. And hey, folks, where we're headed, there is a tsunami of grief that is not coming, that mm. is breaking upon us. Yeah. Right? This is why this is important. Yeah. This is why grieving is important. It's about resilience, about those who will be left standing mm-hmm. as the tsunami of grief breaks upon us as we realize the consequences of what we have wrought over the last 250 years in the culture that we have created and what it has done to us and to the earth, uh, this is going to radically transform whomever survives this will be transformed in what it is to be a human being. And the capacity to grieve all of that is essential. And you you just said use the word resilience, which made me think about something that well, I work with a lot of adolescents. <laughs> I see this most common with adolescent boys, but you know, if it's showing up a lot in adolescent boys, then I think it's probably at the foundation of a lot of masculine culture in particular. <laughs> I think that's absolutely that, true. <laughs> I don't know. That's just my vibe about it. Um, but the thing that I see often is that the idea of getting into grief is is understood as weakness but what i'm hearing you say is that grieving builds resilience and is necessary for resilience yes can you speak to that a little more uh yeah absolutely the idea that it's weakness it is right to to grieve is to um encounter our finitude our limit Hmm. our loss what we are in fact not in control of which is just about everything yeah Right? This is not popular in a, a, a hyper masculine patriarchal culture, which is about dominance and control. Don't tell me I'm not in control. I can't tolerate that. Right. That is a very brittle, fragile position. Right? Yeah. It does not take much to take you down if you're in that position. Yeah. For one who can ground into the earth, into the loss encounter the reality of all that we are not in control of like this is it makes for a very flexible pliable person who can roll with a lot Mm -hmm. right it is also um, a profoundly it leads to connection Mm -hmm. right and strength is in connection not right this is We've gotten here through this siloed, hyper-individual, extractive, consumptive, right? That right. whole ideal is what's gotten us to where we are. Yeah. Grief is a move into the arms of the mother, mm. right? Um, and I mean that in a kind of Jungian right. sense. Uh, but that, that's where resilience is, and it's all like the days ahead are all about resilience, not strength, right? But resilience. Ooh, that's that's powerful. The days ahead are about resilience, not strength. I think those that that phrase might echo for a while. Yeah. A couple other obstacles: um, our flatline culture, our commitment to emotional mediocrity. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, it's good. I'm good. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's that has a strong influence. Our self consciousness that um, we're so conscious of being perceived these days. The, the idea of performance: mm. Am I going to do it right? Am I going to grieve right? Am I going to am I going to be ugly crying? Uh, uh, yeah, right. That stops us, and just a real dearth of communal practice. We don't have any idea how to do this. Yeah, together, May, like. We've all been to maybe some good memorial services and funerals. If we're lucky, we've gone to some great ones. Yeah. Um, That's about it. Like, where else do you go to grieve together? Where is that invited? Where is that allowed? Horror movies. (laughs) Uh, Maybe, actually. (laughs) That was was my answer. (laughs) During my period of prolonged grief, every horror film was a a chance to grieve communally. Um, uh, On this topic... Let's 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 go let's go to this. You brought up these grief rituals. You've brought uh, back again to the com- the necessity of the communal nature of this yes. process and this this technology, uh, this work 
um, and the idea that psychotherapy is not enough. So can you talk a little bit about, about these rituals, about, about, I think you've laid a pretty clear foundation about why individual work (laughs) is not sufficient. Um, can you talk about the work that you do, what the function of a ritual is? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, Right. Again, grief is at the very dawn of human culture. Mm-hmm. It is one of the first expressions, and it has always been a communal act. And the way I come to this, uh, and the way that Francis, well, I shouldn't speak for Francis, but uh, that, that many of the people I work with uh, are following, and Francis did work with the Somais, uh, Maladome and Sabonfu Somme. Uh, came from... That's a person. Uh, there are two people. Two a people. couple. Okay. Uh, Maladoma. Okay. And, uh, and Sabonfu. Okay. Somme are from the Dagara tribe in Burkina Faso. Okay. In West Africa. And in the 70s, somewhere in there, the elders of their tribe looked to the West and asked themselves, why are these people so dangerous, so mm. uh, ruthless, actually? Yeah. And like etym- etymologically, Ruthless literally means, it goes back to Ruth in the Old English, which is grief. So to be ruthless is to be without grief. Well, right? And they said these white, this white Western culture is so dangerous because they have forgotten how to grieve. Go, we send you as missionaries. They sent Maladoma and Sabonfu's missionaries to the United States. To teach these people, re- remind them how to grieve. Yeah. Take our practices, adapt them to what they could understand, help them remember. Mm-hmm. And, and the grief work that I've come in contact with flows from that. It's what's developed over the last three, four decades from Maladoma and Sabonfu's work. It's not what happened. It, it's not what happens in the Dakar tribe. It's, it's quite different. Right. But it's inspired by their understanding of grief as something that happens in the village. Mm. Right? So mm-hmm. it is a communal act. Yeah. Uh, ritual, again, I'll, I'll, I'll share some of Francis' ideas about ritual. And Francis, if you ever hear this, I, I want some of your royalties for all the, <laughs> all, all the acknowledgement I'm giving you. <laughs> uh, he's a good there's teacher, a, though. There's um, a spike in book sales right yeah. after this episode comes out. <laughs> I want a piece of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Molly Moon's gift card or right? something. I don't know. Yeah. So Francis' definition of ritual is any gesture done singly or in community done with emotion and intention that attempts to connect transpersonal energies for healing or transformation, right? So Mm. a gesture done with emotion and intention toward healing and transformation. The purpose of ritual is to become transparent to the transcendent. I love that, Mm. right? To become transparent to the transcendent and to repair the tears in the experience of belonging that result from the daily injuries of being human. And this is some of Francis' writing. So I love his writing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I keep finding myself as the host of this show wanting to be like, well, let's slow down and define those terms. And then as I even think about that, it feels like offensive. (laughs) (laughs) Almost like, well, like it means a lot of things. Yes. And we could like pick one and settle on one of those potential meanings. But as we've kind of started with in this conversation to engage with and talk about grief is to talk about such a multiplicity of like humanity that if we do try to boil it down in our sort of standard define our terms way, we're doing a disservice to like to human being. Yes. Yes. Cause it's the attempt to grasp it. Yeah. To, to wrestle it into. Right. And it's really the invitation is to swim in that. Like, wow. Yeah. To, to become transparent to the transcendent mm-hmm. is the purpose of ritual, to let ourselves be fully seen by that which we can't even define. Yeah. Uh, toward the end of repairing the tears in our sense of belonging that we just accumulate. So, so as in, in lieu of, of defining some of these terms, I'd like to offer up some story. A little bit, if that's okay. Yeah. From from my own prolonged experience of grief, um, it was it was a process that I, I shared with my partner at the time. The grief was one that we both lived with, and we both were walking through, and we each had some of our own rituals that we that we did 
both singularly and together. Yes. Um, one of them was we developed a ritual of a walk at sunrise at a park near every, once a week near our house. And that was very explicitly so that we could have space to process through this grieving that we were doing. And sometimes we'd spend the whole walk processing and talking and just sharing. And some days we'd talk about it a little bit and then do it a little bit less. And then there were more distinctive things that we did as well. Um, and I'll get her permission before including this in the episode. But one thing that my partner did was once a month, she would find an object of significance in the process. And this object could be something from like um, a piece of a plant that she saw and while she was sitting and thinking and feeling or a, um, a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a like air, airliner sized liquor bottle <laughs> of sure. like of alcohol that that she would bought uh, for herself in the process. Um, and she collected all of these things in a box and uh a little glass box and over the course of our process the glass box accumulated these items and when our process was done um she took the box and she put it away and it's now in our closet um we still have it none of those things are gone but they're no longer in a position of prominence in our home um another example this is sort of the, that first gate loss of a loved one. I found out about a coworker who was pretty important to me. Um, and after I left the job a few years later, I ran into one of my old coworkers and found out that this person, Darren, had died very suddenly, very unexpectedly. And he meant a lot to me. And so I took... Uh, he, he used to drink a lot of vodka and smoke a lot of cigarettes with me. And that was like a thing that we would do after work. And so I bought a cheap bottle of vodka and his favorite pack of cigarettes. And I went to a place we were caterers. And I remember a few catering events that we did together in Discovery Park that, that were just him and I. And it was, it was good. It was just good. So I went to Discovery Park and I drank some of the vodka and I smoked one of the cigarettes and I spoke to him. And then I left the vodka and cigarettes in the park for him. Um, so those those are examples. Do these do these sort of things fit the the definition of ritual? As you're, they're more singular. They're yeah, not communal. Absolutely. But... Yeah, and and ritual can be right singular. Like, and these are gestures. It's not it's not simply sitting and thinking about Darren or right. you and your partner thinking about this loss. These are. These were en enacted gestures, embodied gestures. They were movements. They were offerings. Yeah. Right? So you are also uh, kind of implicitly involving other aspects of reality, right? Other, wh whatever language works for you for, yeah. for what is beyond this mm -hmm. realm that we dwell in, Um they were gestures that were calling to and including and calling upon right. those. And what, like, are you aware of how they, were they helpful? Yeah, oh, massively, yeah. massively. The, the individual grieving rituals of my, my partner's shrine, as, as she called it, and my going to Discovery Park were hugely important for each of us. And then that, that walk that sort of grief walk that we took once a week together, um, like was absolutely essential for the two of us being able to stay connected during that time. Yeah. Cause if we were just trying to manage our grief individually and at times we were, it was bad for both of us. We right. were not well people, right. but with the ritual of the walk together and this understanding like, yeah, we are going to talk about it once a week while we walk to, to the ocean and watch the sunrise where we sometimes was sufficient. Right. The, the, our conversations weren't super transcendent. They weren't, we weren't quoting poetry to one another often. Right. Usually we were just there. Right. Which is a practice of coherence, mm. right? To walk together to that place, to do that on a regular basis was a, a way of creating coherence between you. Whatever else happened in that, maybe sometimes you 
explicitly talked about it and processed it a bit or sure. not. Yeah. Uh, but um, practices of coherence, and that is essential in in the ritual process in create in the creation of ritual time and space because it's a different time and it's a different space than that which we normally dwell in. Uh, Francis talks about creating the sudden the sudden village and mm. singing, chanting, very important poetry, a lot of poetry, uh, drumming, movement, um, sharing meals together, sharing dreams, mm. small group interactions, speaking in large cir- circles, all of these, create coherence among a group of people yeah right create a sudden village it's amazing how quickly people will a group of 30 strangers will connect mm-hmm. when you do some of these practices and mm-hmm. it's not it's the connection is not based in what i know about you and your story i don't know your story but i can feel connected to you in this embodied way and then enter into um these very structured gestures, like the retreat ends up um, culminating in a, in a grief ritual, which you know, is a, ends up being a two hour long process um, around a shrine that is created by participants with artifacts of the losses and griefs that they're bringing. Um, there's drumming happening, there's chanting happening. People are in motion nonstop mm-hmm. for two hours or longer. So it's a, it's a um, kind of an extreme experience meant to bring people to their edges and beyond. Sure, yeah, a kind yeah. of, um, I can't think of the word, um, transcendence and engineered transcendence. Yeah. Kind of using just very old technologies. All, all of that to open up this space where people can enter into their grieving, not to talk about it, but to go to the shrine and do their grieving, whatever that looks like. That could look like anything. Right. Uh, some some people scream. Some sit there silently. Some weep. Some there's all kinds of ways. But to enter into that and be witnessed. Yeah. To have others witness you doing that when you leave and come back to the village to be thanked. Yeah. For that, to have somebody say to you, thank you, I saw what you did. I, mm-hmm. saw, I saw the work you did on our behalf. Mm. Thank you. It's incredible. Yeah. Right? So that is, that is more than therapy. That is not a group psychotherapy process. Yeah. That is entering into, um, right? It's, re- it's, a, it's a deep spiritual experience that is... Right, it kind of skips over the dogmatic. We're not going to talk about belief systems. Who cares? Right. Let's go yeah. to the experience. I wanted I wanted to land on that because that the the spiritual of it all has been in the background of this conversation from the beginning. Yeah. Right. Like you have an MDiv. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I quoted a theology professor within the first five minutes. Right. Like the the reality that this is. What? Well, uh, how do I want to say this? There is something about this that intersects with the spiritual being of, of, of being a person or, or with like spirituality. And I know for a lot of folks that can be a little, people have good reason to feel suspicious or shy away from things that reach towards the spiritual, either because of their own religious trauma or because of a commitment to sort of a logical, like rational, um, material, like in, embrace of the world. I'm imagining a listener who's hearing this and the, the spiritual talk is maybe kind of turning them off a little bit or making them feel a little suspicious. Could you speak something to those kinds of concerns that someone might have? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, well, there's a lot to say about um, yeah. The distinction between religion and spiritual. Religion is a system. It, it involves dogma and belief and hierarchies. Typically, um, it is what is um, all too frequently weaponized, right? It's yeah. is usually religion. Spirituality, for me, spirituality uh, is, is simply about my relationship to the rest of the universe. Yeah. is what spirituality mm-hmm. is about. Um, I have a personal spirituality, and I, I can share that with others in the 
grief ritual experience, there's not, I have to think about this, but there's really not much talk about dogma. Like people can believe propositionally mm -hmm. whatever, whatever makes sense to them, but this is on a very experiential level and it is about being connected to each other yeah. in a supportive, compassionate way and being connected to um, deep time, to our ancestors, being connected to the planet, to the earth in this particular moment that is literally without referent right. for us as a species. Um, and is that... Does yeah. that get to it? It does. It does. And I, I'm thinking about, we did an episode on uh, shame and religious trauma. Mm -hmm. And in that episode, we talked about spirituality um, kind of being like, well, here's a, an, an, a, an update of that analogy. Spirituality is like a book and religion is like a bookstore. <laughs> Where like, oh. you can have a transformative, meaningful, personal experience with a book. And then the bookstore will be the place you go, you can go to get it from. And the bookstore can also choose which books are allowed and which books are banned. <laughs> and and the, which kind of bookstore you go to will probably predict a little bit what kind of books you'll find there. Yeah. Um, but uh, in that sense, it sounds like what you're inviting uh, in, in this discussion of grief and in these rituals is not uh, a membership to a bookstore. <laughs> it's no. not a club card. It's to, to read the book of your own grief with other people who are also reading the book of our grief and finding that your book is our book. Yes, that it is a shared experience, that the invitation is to move more deeply into one's own experience as a human being at this particular time. Right. With all of the history that we carry of 300,000 years as yeah. a species, we, we do have access to that. We, we forget, we have forgotten. Yeah. We do have access to that we can help each other access that in very like what we do with that is then very individual like each of us will respond in whatever way we are led to respond to yeah. that but we can help each other rediscover these connections these things we've forgotten the right we are all indigenous to the planet mm. every single one of us is indigenous in that sense and i right i acknowledge saying that as a white man right is fraught i, I yeah. accept that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh and like every human being is indigenous to this planet and yeah. it's essential we reconnect with what that means yeah and, what and that means to belong one, yeah this is one way it's not the only way but this sure. is one way to do that yeah there's a part of me that wants to ask like <laughs> This is a, you know, this is a podcast that's put on by a psychotherapy clinic. What's the role of psychotherapy in this? <laughs> is there one? <laughs> uh, the role of psychotherapy in this. Um, yeah, I think it's very uh, helpful. Like, I think it's a both and. To yeah. enter into this kind of communal work and have a therapist who's open to talking about, like, really processing what comes up Yeah. for this, uh, what we actually didn't get to yeah it was a question about like well what does grief have to do with relational right psychotherapy with psychodynamic psychotherapy if like my understanding of psychodynamic therapy is it is a fundamentally about relationship yeah right and grief is about the fact that we will lose every relationship we have and it is the process of metabolizing the loss of all of these relationships yeah and we also Right, we now in another sense, in a psychodynamic sense, we never lose these relationships, they stay with us, yeah. Right, but having uh, right, a good um, psychotherapeutic container or relationship to process, yeah, um, not only what happens in the communal grief work, um, but I think you know, very importantly, um, particularly at the, the third gate, uh, what's happening in the world i think it is yeah really important to have places to be able to um process that work with that uh really dive into that with somebody who's going to be able to witness yeah this this is a conversation that never ends 
right? Like yeah. inherently, it doesn't it doesn't end. But kind in the same way that these gates can be invitations into that eternal process that builds resilience, that it that does heal, that does connect. Uh, my hope is that the listeners have maybe begun some of that, continued some of that, found some of that grieving eternal process um, in in this in this conversation that they've listened in on and taken part of in in their own heads as well. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> in the, in that space between your ears, where where we currently reside. Um, before we wrap up, um, do you have recommendations for further learning? Uh, for anyone who's heard this and is like, okay, yes, this has started a conversation. I want to keep going for myself. Yes. Uh, if somebody wants to read about it, again, I know I mentioned Francis many times. The Wild Edge of Sorrow mm-hmm. uh, is kind of his primary book on that. Uh, Martin Prechtel, uh, what is the title? The Smell, it's really poetic title. Uh, the Smell of Rain on Dust, Grief and Praise. Martin wow. Prechtel. Great read. Even better on YouTube. Like, go find the YouTube. It's just audio. There's no yeah. video, but it's great to listen to. Um, as far as experiments, um, one that's pretty simple and daring, find a grief conversation. Well, find a grief witness mm. partner. Mm-hmm. Um, someone who is going to be willing, perhaps, to, uh, who will be willing to hear your grief. Sit down with each other. Give each other both 15 minutes uninterrupted mm. to simply speak your, the grief that you feel, that you carry about whatever, any of these gates, whatever grief that you carry, to, to simply be able to talk about it and have somebody listen. And please, please, please do not let it turn into a conversation. The only response after 15 minutes is thank you. Mm. Don't let it become a back and forth. Just witness hmm. just receive and hold and do that for somebody like have somebody do that for you it's it's amazing yeah. what can happen in that um right that's something to try at home if you're up for it uh to uh go to the link tree mm-hmm. um and and find uh, there's lots of grief rituals happening in puget sound we are rich in grief mentors mm. in Puget Sound. So we have a, a quite unusual amount of grief rituals happening. Great. Um, they're scary. It's daunting to go. It's intimidating. Uh, right? Every time I go, I still have a voice saying, what are you doing? This is nuts. Um, go, try it out. Like, see what it's like. Yeah. And does someone need to be in a place of active loss or grief to go to one of these or it, it sounds like and i ask that because i can imagine someone who's hearing this episode and is like this all really resonates with me but like i'm fine uh go to the ritual <laughs> great <laughs> right? awesome we are all uh we are all actively grieving we might not be in touch with it actually the caution is if you've had like if you've lost a spouse or a child in the mm-hmm. last two months, that might be a little, like you might be a little too much into it. That's like find a one-on-one mm-hmm. first and process that a bit before you take that into, mm-hmm. if it's that raw. Um, but if you're thinking like, oh, I don't have anything going, you, you'll be surprised. Go <laughs> to the ritual. <laughs> you'll be surprised. Delightful. <laughs> I like this. This is a good invitation. And then um, before we uh, end... Um, if people would like to find you, where would you like to be found? Uh, probably my website is, is the best way to, to find me, uh, Jabin counseling, Mm -hmm. J A B I N counseling.com. And there's a grief and grieving resource page where you can Mm -hmm. kind of find these things that I've mentioned. And you, you offer psychotherapy, pastoral counseling. I know you're also leading one of the mentoring groups through the Alliance. Uh, yes, that would be first so, time this year so. doing that. And spiritual spiritual direction, that was a mm. gift of COVID. I didn't uh, do spiritual direction before, but now now I do. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of ways you can be accessed. Yeah. yeah. And then you brought, you brought something for us to end on. Uh, yes, it's uh, a favorite poem that I uh, can't get enough of that um, I think just really sums up why grief, why it's important, and where we are. So this is Bearing Witness by Laura Weaver. 
Sometimes we are asked to stop and bear witness. This the elephants say to me in dreams as they thunder through the passageways of my heart, disappearing into a blaze of stars. On the edge of the sixth mass extinction, with species vanishing before our eyes, we'd be a people gone mad if we did not grieve. We'd be a people gone mad if we did not grieve. This unmet grief, an elder tells me, is the root of the root of the collective illness that got us here. His people stay current with their grief. They see their tears as medicine, and grief a kind of generous willingness to simply see, to look loss in the eye, to hold tenderly what is precious, to let the reins of the heart fall. In this way, they do not pass this weight on in invisible mailbags for the next generation to carry. In this way, the grief doesn't build and build like sets of waves until at some point down the line, it simply becomes an unbearable ocean. We are so hungry when we are fleeing our grief, when we are doing all we can to distract ourselves from the crushing heft of the unread letters of our ancestors. Hear us, they call, hear us. In my dreams, the elephants stampede in herds, trumpeting, shaking the earth. It is a kind of grand finale, a last parade of their exquisite beauty. See us, they say. We may not pass this way again. What if our grief, given as a sacred offering, is a blessing, not a curse? What if our grief not hidden away in corners becomes a kind of communion where we shine. What if our grief becomes a liberation song that returns us to our innocence? What if our fierce hearts could simply bear witness? Bearing witness, Laura Weaver. Peter, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, thank you. Special thanks to Peter Jabin for coming on to this episode of the podcast. Peter can be found at his website, jabincounseling.com. Link in the show notes. Also in the show notes, you'll find a link to the link tree that Peter mentioned. This page is kept up to date with dates and sign-up information for grief ritual retreats and ongoing grief groups. The list includes in-person and virtual opportunities, so if you're at all interested in engaging with the communal reality of grieving, I highly encourage you to check out that link tree. In the show notes, you'll also find links to the books that Peter recommended. The Relational Psych Podcast is a production of Relational Psych, a mental health clinic providing depth-oriented psychotherapy and psychological testing in person in Seattle and virtually throughout Washington State. If you are interested in psychotherapy or psychological testing for yourself or a family member, links to our contact information are in the show notes. If you are a psychotherapist and would like to be a guest on the show, or are a listener with a suggestion for someone you'd like us to interview, you can contact me at podcast at relationalpsych.group. The Relational Psych Podcast is hosted and produced by me, Tyson Connor. Sam Claney is our executive producer with technical support by Ali Ray and the team at Virtual Ally. Carly Claney is our CEO. Our music is by Ben Lewis. We love you, buddy.